largest in the system for startups. With over 1 lakh registered globally recognized inventors as well. Now with the budget that is going to approach, which is a reasonable budget for before India gets into the Lok Sabha election mode, expectations are coming high. And I come to you from the startup capital of India, which is Bengaluru, and I come to you from one of the startup campuses, which also belongs to an air ambulance service, ICAT. I have with me a set of panelists from different sectors of the startup industry, and I also have employees who work in different set of uh, startups. Uh, today we come to you from Bengaluru to discuss what are the expectations with regards to the union budget 2024. And I start with the founder of uh, this very place, ICAT. Uh, what are your expectations, Shalini? Today we are uh, here heading towards the best of best um, uh, in all fields like you know reaching out to Mars uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, today Bangalore is called to be one of them and there is no field in which India is lagging behind. If you look at the economy as well, India is emerging to be the fastest growing economy and the civil aviation like just a uh, couple of days ago where the Wings uh, India Air Show was held, hundreds of Boeings were ordered both by Akasa Airlines, Indigo, take it for that. And uh, India is today like almost the fifth largest aviation, civil aviation sector. Unfortunately, if you look at the emergencies where the helicopters are playing a very big role in terms of airlifting patients in the Western world, we having like every four minutes one death. And also the organ um, world, if you look at it, recipients of the organ, 95% of them dying before they get the organ where we lack in the air logistics, both in terms of saving lives and also um, people like, you know, work, waiting on the transplant list. Why was not a single helicopter was ordered for a helicopter emergency medical services? With our infrastructure go, growing um, um, at a roaring um, rate and then we having national highways, if you look at the Mysore Bangalore Highway today, one of the best in the world, but do we have um, an a kind of an emergency service which is able to rescue people on the same road if there is an accident. In fact, allow me to interrupt. Uh, there has been uh, several articles that really talks about, you know, the aviation sector and the kind of uh, budgeting that has been done for that. What are your chief concerns, especially with respect to uh, the GST? I'm told that the GST does not really apply in certain places, but applies when it comes to, you know, procuring certain uh, items. Does that play a crucial role in your budgeting, Mr. Rahul? Yes, uh, that's uh, a big problem for uh, people like us, the startups like us, and services like us, which are rendering emergency medical services. Uh, uh, we pay the GST, but we cannot incur the GST, we cannot offload the GST. So that has become a major problem for us. And uh, the other thing is, you know, the import of uh, aircraft, especially for services like ours, you know, we are rendering uh, uh, helicopter emergency medical services for people that need them the most. There is an import duty. And uh, as per the DGCS regulations, there is not a single helicopter which fulfills the HEMS criteria uh, to, you know, to undertake uh, HEMS missions. We all know that, the whole aviation industry knows that, the government knows that. And uh, for that, we have to import uh, helicopters from abroad, but we uh, are asked to pay an import duty. If that can be waived off, if uh, the, the, the Honorable Finance Minister can waive that off. The other thing I really wanted to highlight here is the cost of aviation, the cost of saving lives. Uh, uh, you know, for a cost of a luxury uh, uh, villa, we can save 1,000 lives with one helicopter. One helicopter can perform about 1,000 missions in a year for the cost of one a luxury villa. And I want this message to be heard by the decision makers that, you know, please f put this in the healthcare budget. Uh, uh, you know the, the price of a uh, uh, of a uh, hems uh, mission for karnataka we need two hems bases one in bangalore one in hubli for for a lot of other states we only need one helicopter and we can uh, prove the, the the concept of saving thousands of lives with one helicopter no, in fact, uh, saving lives definitely took a center stage, especially in the last few years uh, with the COVID pandemic. Another relevant uh, 
uh, sector that gained a lot of importance is mental health. And uh, I have with me a person here uh, among the panelists, Mr. Satish, who comes from that sector. And uh, tell me one thing, Mr. Satish, when it comes to mental health, what is the kind of budget that is being allotted for that? Is it really enough? What are the chief concerns in that space? First of all, thank you for having me on the panel. You know, I would finally go down to say I'm glad that mental health, rehabilitation care and managed care has found its space and a voice in a country like India. Uh, it's been a journey for us. Um, I would say that even today, mental health, mental health budgets are extremely dis dismal. I have ma we've made this appeal in multiple occasions, but this is again a time. But things are fast changing. We, our budgets are still really at 1% of the overall health budget of the country. But we represent about 15% of the population who need services, care at any point in time. These are with diagnosed conditions at various touch points that, that is available. So mental health uh, has seen a, a huge influx of attention uh, with respect to preventive, promotive mental health. A lot of work that is happening with minor mental health issues, early identification of um, illness issues and problems. You see a lot of startups and including us, where we have incubated uh, various programs that work with uh, individuals in the community, in schools, in corporates. So that's, that's one space. The other space that really de deserves attention in mental health is what is to do with acute emergencies or psychiatric emergencies. I did have a chance to talk to my co-panelists before. We were talking about trance you know, moving uh, individuals who sometimes need to be moved from far off locations and commonly where we operate in another country as well. So that's, that's really where it is and psychiatric emergencies don't get that due attention. And the other space is to do with rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, I bring our attention and focus to this is because recoveries are prolonged, be it with mental health, be it with uh, physical health, uh, rehabilitation as well. It could be with physiotherapy, guided, um, you know, putting them, put, putting somebody back onto feet and senior care. These are spaces that we work with and all of this needs attention. And my expectation from this budget is it's about time that we give managed care, rehabilitation, the attention it deserves. So that is about uh, really ensuring that the burden doesn't pass on to the you know, the already suffering and their families who are associated with it. This would be my opening remarks, but I would wait for the other questions as we go along. Well, in fact, all of us have been hungry for proper budgeting, but we are also, you know, uh, looking at the food chain spaces, the hospitality industry in India. How is the startup and the hospitality industry space really working together as far as uh, the union budget is concerned? I believe um, the Indian QSR ecosystem is um, going through a evolution at this point of time and as Indians, uh, primarily uh, the foreign brands, uh, may be a KFC or a Domino's, so we have been uh, an operator blood. So in India there has not been a lot of incubation towards building FNB brands, building quick service restaurants and uh, FNB is one sector which has been highly unorganized. So today, in the market, I believe 30% of occupancy of the retail stores are directly or indirectly through QSR spaces, but they are not organized. May it be farming or may it be production, may it be the MSMEs which are working at the back end of food processing, food related processing, packaging. So there are a lot of other verticals which are directly or indirectly related to the QSR space. But unfortunately, QSR space has not been getting the right amount of traction that it should get. The biggest pain point for us as QSR operators, Indian QSR operators, Indian QSR curators and operators uh, has been uh, uh, the input uh, ta uh, tax credit. So for us it acts as an 18% of cost uh, and which in turn uh, reduces the, uh, the, the fact of getting the ROI in a quicker amount of time. So to, to make India uh, probably, if I, if I uh, treat the neighboring country China, which has a similar set of population that we do have today, when their uh, QSR revenues are at 178, 180 billion dollar a year, India is at 25 billion dollar, which is almost a gap of 7x. And I believe this is something uh, 
which is uh, which is a touch point of every individual of the whole population every single day three times a day in the past budgets there has been substantial amount of grants for msme sector but not specific to the qsr so my personal uh, uh, recommendation and, and uh, as as i represent the whole qsr fraternity um, uh, would be that input tax simplification of taxation so qsr in india is not a uh, not an organized business and it will take some years to be organized and then the parameters can be set so in the early stage of evolution i believe this needs simplification as well as uh, this will be needing uh, a reduction of tax as well in fact you know um Mr. Biraj is actually the founder of uh, Biggie's Burger, and um, it's not as easy to just you know take a bite of the burger as <laughs> it is uh, with respect to you know uh, budgeting for different industries or startups. I have with me Mr. Siddharth, who comes from the edutech sector, and uh, is it really as easy, uh, you know, uh, like taking a bite of a burger to studying really very hard? Um, I would say, of course, like others. it's it has not been easy for edtech sector also and uh, if i look at the budget per se over the last 10 years government has done a phenomenal job when it comes to providing uh, keeping up to the times especially if i look at uh, uh, f- technologies like artificial intelligence government has established new centers and has always been very proactive when it comes to advancing such centers uh, last year we also announced setting up of 100 5g centers Uh, i would have two concrete suggestions to the government uh, when it comes to the budget one is the involvement of private sector so if we look at uh, india of recent times government has been very proactive in certain spaces and has involved private sectors beautifully for example if we talk about space or defense government has involved startups really well over there and startups today are part of uh, manufacturing there as well as even launching rockets for the government and are at you know fr- a frontier of uh, developing technologies for the military today but when it's com- when it comes to education there's still a lot that can be done and it's not just about involving more private universities it's also you know involving alternate spaces alternate uh, setups at techs uh, and to be part and partner of the government and help india upskill more second i would say india has tremendous potential to attract international students and that can act as a you know st- strong strength to grow the gdp of india unfortunately the share of international students coming in india has been very low uh, perhaps government can introduce more scholarships to initiate that process and attract more and more high quality students which will eventually lead to huge inflow of foreign uh, currency as well in this india you know uh, anywhere that i travel when i tell them that i hail from bengaluru the first thing or the first reaction that emerges is oh that is the startup hub and it gives me immense pleasure to hail from the startup hub but then there is also you know when it comes to global funding the kind of uh, boom in funding that we saw in 2022 is not the same when it comes to 2023 there is we are talking about at least a 73% decline what would you attribute these factors to i mean i throw the floor open to probably him. i'll start sure with thing. it I, i think the biggest reason for first of all the increase in funding was also the you know change in um, interest rates in us so it almost went down to zero which was like once in a 100 years thing probably so that's why you know you saw a lot of capital influx not just in india but usa and everywhere in the world with interest rates being tightened up significantly in the us the liquidity has dried up and this funding scenario will continue Uh, perhaps it will improve but uh, we foresee that in the next year is also we will not have a scenario like 2021 and 22 so all the startups should gear up for it all the companies should gear up for it and i'm pretty sure you know profitability is the keyword that you'll be hearing in bangalore also today true in fact you know ai is another thing that uh, siddharth really touched upon i mean uh, would you say that you know the um, entrance of artificial intelligence into different sectors has kind of changed the scenario for startups how would you look at it i'll take this uh, question more so from the healthcare perspective i uh, ai uh, and um, you know the advanced technologies are a thing to be with and as healthcare organizations be it uh, any work that we do i that's one space that all of us are starting to stay invested in and we're also investing into it for the future there are two aspects to it one is from the patient information touch point to screen out the f- first set of questions where the clarity comes from uh, 
and the other aspect is to assist the clinicians and in the service delivery whatever helps in excellence of care is the aspects to how we're looking at it from the healthcare services standpoint it may be different in the secondary and the tertiary healthcare space and the pharmaceutical space which i may not have a very specific opinion but in the healthcare services delivery this is one of the key focus um, areas and um, and especially with mental health i think it's the psychology chatbots and uh, you know the screening tools the initial questions that uh, get answered with is what is there but AI as a speciality, to be honest, is one technology space is extremely fast growing compared to the previous ones. You know, the adaptation has forced us all to adapt to it a little quicker than what we would have otherwise. I mean, this is from uh, here, this space, and that's well, what you're looking well, you at. Well, you know, adopting AI is one, but then <laughs> most of them seem to say that, you know, their jobs are being replaced by AI. And layoffs have been a big issue when it comes to, you know, the different established tech firms. Since you actually come from, you know, both spheres, yeah. the startup sphere as well as the established ones, I mean, how do you see this entire layoffs playing a key role? Does it also really affect the startup industry? Not, not specifically with, with, with healthcare, because uh, for us, the technology and the AI is, is really about aiding, um, it's about excelling service delivery, um, you know, and enhancement. It, it may do so in replacing, uh, you know, individuals only in our admin workforces and very limited to operational roles, but not, more, not specifically with the clinical aspect. I have a, I have a very uh, interesting observation, I mean, we, we have, uh, in, from ICAT is, you know, we have developed uh, our uh, uh, early warning scoring systems as well as our uh, uh, remote monitoring systems that we have been, uh, been uh, you know, we, were, we had the opportunity to employ it in disaster zones as well as in medical emergencies. Uh, apart, you know, rather than laying off, it has actually increased our efficiency and our performances. It has actually, uh, uh, on the contrary, it has increased our penetration as well as increase the number of staff that we would want and also the, the, our reach has improved, especially with the introduction of AI. So coming to the artificial intelligence which you brought up, I think it's uh, uh, com uh, healthcare, we can't ignore it today. Uh, thank God we are not artificial enough to be replaced as doctors. <laughs> so, um, although like, you know, uh, they say we can't replace artificial intelligence with the skill set what the doctors carry, it's been a brilliant assisting tool. Yes. Uh, the, the, uh, when, when we come to like, you know, preventive medicine as well, and uh, for example, you take it a traffic management system, and uh, people like you know predicting who's going to have a stroke, a heart attack, and who's especially like you know last couple of years there has been a massive increase in sudden cardiac deaths. So they are coming up with a system where people from their uh, lifestyle, from their f uh, kind of a family history, genetics, we can predict the person who's going to have uh, a cardiac event or a you know, stroke event at a certain point of time and. Uh, you know, he'll be able to be notified like, you know, you need to go to the closer hospital and things like that. This is the advance that's happening. So artificial intelligence is going to help the healthcare system in a big manner. As Rahul said, we already have adopted into ICAT in terms of uh, when we did the Kerala disaster, we kind of tracked all the sick patients and triggered the care to be the aircraft to be deployed and airlifted as well. So it is definitely a big boon to us. In fact, uh, when it comes to the aviation, R&D is one sector that has definitely been neglected is what I hear. I, I don't know what other highlights that you would uh, like to emphasize on. But um, does the budget really include these aspects of R&D into their research and things like that for budgeting purposes? <clears throat> now, that, that obviously, that's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, especially, you know, the aviation is a technologically very advanced uh, uh, sector. Uh, although our own manufacturing and design uh, units that we have, uh, the NAL and the HAL, are doing a phenomenal work and uh, developing newer uh, uh, aircrafts, uh, for, you know, being completely uh, made in India. And uh, uh, fortunately, we have uh, an opportunity to work with uh, NAL. Uh, in developing their Saras Mark II aircraft into a flying uh, operation theater. This is one of its kind aircraft which is going to be developed, you know, uh, there's no other aircraft which is a flying operation theater. And we are fortunate enough to be partnering with NAL and, uh, and uh, developing this first aircraft ever. 
and uh, that you know uh, speaks volumes about you know uh, India's initiatives into make in India as well as uh, you know in cutting edge uh, technology and especially in aviation. And I would also like to make uh, a, a small comment from the previous uh, question about funding. Uh, there is a, a big interest among uh, financial institutions across the world into investment in aviation in India. This is the, the, the most rapidly uh, evolving in, uh, uh, sector in India uh, from an infancy to uh, at this stage and under the visionary leadership uh, of uh, Mr. Sindhya and the Prime Minister. Uh, this sector is going to evolve and erupt uh, to a, a massive industry. Uh, there's a lot of funding available. The, what we want from the government and this uh, uh, budget is to support from the government towards uh, uh, the healthcare sector yeah. of use of these aircraft. And this is where we are lacking and this is what we are appealing the government to. Um, there's one last question. Uh, when it comes to the Make in India initiative, as well as uh, the policies that have been introduced by the government with respect to startups alone, how do you see that? How do you rate uh, Modi 2.0? I think it's, um, I mean, we've, we've had the opportunity to use a couple of these uh, schemes for, um, you know, the, uh, the spin-off and the new entities that we floated. Um, it was the first time that at least I have heard of in the last uh, five to ten years. It's a good beginning. There could be room for more. Uh, I would go down to say if somebody could underwrite the entrepreneurial risk. <laughs> you know, it's always, uh, it's always that space of uh, being able to have the institutional. But uh, from the institutional funding standpoint, from the banking and the other spaces, with the two to three schemes that are available, they, they seem to be uh, I mean, they, they seem to be accessible at least uh, from, the the, from the healthcare services standpoint because it did fall under what is called the priority sector for sure. the last two to three years. So that has been the promising trend that I have, have particularly seen. But as, as you go along in, in healthcare, I think it's uh, nowadays the clarity of, uh, it has already been brought up on the panel, but I think it's the clarity of GST as well, right? You know, when you... Uh, overlap with rehab care and the managed care, suddenly if you're managing a senior care or managing addiction services or physiotherapy, you can't be under the ambit of uh, additional taxes. So that's, that's the space. I think uh, as, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. What would you say? I believe uh, Make in India, when you say, I think um, uh, the way we see it is Make in Bharat, the real Bharat. I believe T2, T3 cities, T4 cities are the other uh, new markets that are evolving and uh, they are growing at a better CAGR. So, uh, for, for, for India, we are having a singular budget which may not be applicable for all the hierarchies of cities. So, let's say logistic, uh, we do not have processing units or cold chains across all the major, except the major cities. So, definitely there should be some provision of uh, lowering the taxes on or waiving of the taxes on for functions that are operating from T2 and T3 cities because of the cost uh, added cost to operate that. The second is, um, as Indians, pro probably in the last uh, two decades, uh, it is only in the last five years where the choice of profession has changed, or, or else it was farming, or engineers, or doctors. There was nothing else, or teachers. So, uh, but the mature markets, uh, like US and other markets, China as well, has uh, this entrepreneurs and uh, franchisepreneurs as well. So, as, as a franchise company, we, in ha we house 67 franchises at this point of time um, uh, through multiple channels. But the, the, the influx of a franchise becomes tough when the taxation is so high on franchise fees as well. So the initial capex is, it, it becomes a challenge for bringing more and more people into the ecosystem of trying out the franchise route and then becoming an entrepreneur. So, so I believe uh, that the whole incubation uh, has to be given a relaxation in terms of the uh, tax for the entry point. So the entry barriers seems to be a little on a tougher side to make uh, more and more entrepreneurs in the country. Thank, thank you. you so much. I thank all the panelists as well as uh, uh, the several uh, employees who have joined us and 
worked as audiences for us. Thank you so much, uh, the viewers who have been watching this uh, show as well. One message that I've definitely carried from here is that uh, from saving lives, we need to also save money. Uh, and that is the message that I carry along after this uh, particular show. And I hope that uh, the budget that we are looking forward to would definitely help the startup capital of India, Bengaluru. And this time around, uh, when it comes to global funding, we would uh, rise from the fifth place to the top. That is what uh, we all are aspiring for as uh, citizens of this country.